<laughs> Jason, you've got to have some hobbies. If, uh, me? Um, not really. I work a lot. Um, I, I'm behind on TV shows. I just, I think I'm four episodes into Stranger Things, and it is incredible. I love it. I've only watched one so far, so don't oh, so good. Uh, no, 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 no spoilers. <laughs> um, what else? I mean, I, I used to have, I used to uh, sing. I was in a barbershop quartet for a while. That is um, awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, not now I only sing whenever I play rock band. Uh, <laughs> see, I, I, I know, I know some origami. Um, that's that, that's fun, I guess. Uh, but no, just just gaming, really, um, and. Even now, I, I I think I end up working more than actually having time to play games. Um, but I get obsessed and hooked into just sandbox builder games. Um, I, I was addicted to Ark Survival Evolved for the longest time. Oh, and, nice. And then uh, Factorio was incredible. And then I uh, got into a weird game called Fortress Craft, which is like Minecraft meets Factorio. Uh, no, no, no singing. I'm far, far too embarrassed now. Uh, maybe later, kids, after I get a few more drinks in me. asking you to sing. Oh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know what, what, what to sing. Um, no, no, the person that, that you'd really want to hear singing is uh, Stephanie Dowling, because uh, we actually used her voice in uh, Dead Money. Yeah, we, uh, uh, Mikey Dowling, one of our and then uh, Justin Bell set up the main theme song for Dead Money, and then uh, Stephanie sang it. Yeah, that was great. What game series would you most like to work on if you could? Uh, let's go to Jessica. I would actually really like to work on something that's not part of a game series sometimes. <laughs> 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 They're always series now. Um, so yeah, I, I would really like to work well, on just like, any really property, like, like just yeah, like just anything wildly wildly outlandish. What would you what would be your dream game to work on? And the awkward silence. Wait, are are are, are you asking me like? Yeah, yeah. So, non. It could be anything, just anything, anything. Or, or a few things. Um. Well, just totally out there. I think it'd be really cool if not me, but somebody. Or I'd work on it if somebody wanted to make it. <laughs> Um, someone actually did like a survival fantasy game because really great fantasy novels they're always about surviving not fighting everything and but in fantasy games we always really focus on you being this like amazing um, superhero and 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 really awesome fantasy novels are usually just the opposite so I think that would be be something I'd like to work on sometime. So well, anyway, it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily have to be survival. In fantasy world, is that, is that the gist? Um, yeah, kind of like, almost like a survival horror, but set in a, more of a traditional, not a traditional fantasy world of some sort. So, that'd be fun. I'm very, I'm, I'm boring. Like, I, 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 I'm not thinking of original stuff. Like, the first things that came to my mind, or just, oh, I'd love to work on a Monkey Island game or an XCOM game. Oh, Command and Conquer, definitely. I love Command and Conquer. Maybe a Tribes game, like the Star Siege Tribes is really cool. And then, oh, oh, and and I really love this game series, Mech Warrior and Battletech. Those are really fun. Um, I, I, I just love so many games. And I mean, System Shock as well. Holy crap, Fallout, I got to work on that. Like, my career in the industry has pretty much just been a fanboy's dream where I'm working on games that I played younger uh, when I was younger, and, and now I'm contributing in bringing them forward in the industry and, and evolving them and building on them. It's it's a dream come true. It's it's pretty cool. I love it. Um, yeah, I think that's what's really amazing about the Systems Out project, since that's why we're here, is we're taking some, something that so many people loved and um, bringing it to a new audience. And I think that's really exciting. Chris, what about you? Well, I, you know, to be honest, like, I, I feel. We oh, got no, the... he cut off. There he is. Oh, uh, we, where we got the chance to actually work on all the franchise that we really love. Um, and I, I don't know. I usually, uh, the way it works now is I'm, you know, if there's a franchise I like, I just drop them a line. Or surprisingly enough, there will already be messages from them in my inbox. And then it, and then I'm just like, well, oh, now I'm free to pursue all that stuff. So, and System Shock is is definitely one of them. I remember playing um, 
uh, System Shock 2 for the first time, mostly because my roommate was playing it. I'm like, what the hell is this game? And I'm like, well, it's like a first-person shooter, but wow, you're doing a lot of And then um, I started playing it, and I, I still regard System Shock 2 document for a lot of smart choice to make with a game. Like, you know, one, th one thing I like to point to is the way they did cutscenes in System Shock 2, where you could see the, the ghostly after images of what happened in an area was great because because they were ghosts, you couldn't really mess up the cutscene, which is always a fear of every developer when a cut <laughs> when a cutscene happens with characters you're like, well how can the player mess this up? But then System Shock 2 do like dodged that entire issue by having them be ghosts. And I thought that was brilliant. That was like just one of the many brilliant things they did in that game. But yeah, I, I, I loved it. Well, we're getting more uh, more character questions. Uh, let's see, <laughs> what, what what are your favorite underrated games? Oh wow! Um, uh, FTL. Oh yeah. Uh, I, well, it's, not really underrated? Underrated. it's not really underrated, uh, but I remember like just just you know trying it out, and then like eighty hours later, <laughs> I don't think I don't think I can stop playing this. Um, uh, I don't know. I would what, what do you guys? I think uh, Fortress Craft uh, captured me for, for quite a bit, and I think that's kind of underrated. And that's that's a good gem. If you like sandbox builder games and logic puzzles, that thing's full of them. Um, geez, and then what else? Uh, you know, uh, there, is, there is this game coming out. Uh, I don't know if it's hit, hit uh, release yet, but it's called The Westport Independent. And uh, it, it's a newspaper game, so strangely enough, but bear with me where the goal of the game is actually to sort of edit text and remove text from articles to potentially influence factions in the city. And it's the first game that I've ever seen about censorship as a game mechanic. And I, I don't know how it's, if it's, but I thought the mechanic was brilliant, especially after doing so many articles. They're like, okay, words, words, words. But then the Westport Independent is like, but this game's about subtracting words from articles to make certain points. And I thought that was kind of a brilliant game mechanic. And I thought, I'm looking forward to see how well it does. If it's... Uh, Jessica, any underrated games that you particularly enjoyed? I'm trying to think what counts as an underrated game. Because um... <laughs> there, there's certainly games like, I'm a huge Ico fan, but it's not really underrated. Everyone loves it. It just didn't do well when it came out. Um, and so I'm trying to think of games that, I don't know. Oh, we have a question in Twitch from our very own Stephen Kick. Uh, oh. He has a question. Has Chris played Sunless Sea? No, it's currently sitting on my desktop right now. Uh, it's because I got distracted by uh, this war of mine. Oh, uh, oh, that's so depressing, but good. Yeah, you know the, what really uh, brought me in was the was this war of mine's art style. I really like the, the sort of pencil, pencil sketchy feel of the, the environment and the fact that it's kind of like a strategic platformer. Like I, 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 I I'm really enjoying it. So I, I guess I got kind of distracted with that. You know that was uh, done by some people that worked on The Witcher. What? Yeah. I don't know if enjoying it is the right word for that game. <laughs> you experience it. <laughs> you go through really it. Really enjoying it. It's great fun. <laughs> well, it's like Darkest Dungeon, right? I, I, I don't know if I'm really enjoying playing it, but I'm kind of like drawn in, so. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, Exolate said, uh, what, do you, what did you write in FTL, Chris Avalon? Well, well, Chris Avalon says that, uh, so in FTL, I worked on the advanced edition, which introduced the new alien race. Uh, I actually did a lot of common encounters and then a few special encounters, but uh, 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 the true writer on both the expansion, the core game was a uh, British author, Tom Joubert, and uh, he deserves a lion's share of the credit. I, me, it was most, I, I got contacted by the FTL guys and they're like, hey, we heard my, like really like our game would you want to write for it for free like you said drunkenly i'm like yes yes i still <laughs> feel that way sober and uh so i just took a few weekends and uh, that was a lot of fun. 
it's like at the time, like I was just doing so many dialogue trees, but FTL sort of allowed for a different form of writing expression. So being able to sort of shake up the gears a little bit was welcome. I feel so bad. We, we've gone so far off the rails. And poor Daniel here is just playing through. <laughs> playing I'm away. Sorry. There's there's some pipes, some beautiful pipes. Look at those pipes. <laughs> Let's talk about the, those pipes and how pipe-like they are. Oh my god, seriously? I'm surprised Rob Lee didn't go crazy uh, with all the loot Holy requests fuck. we have. We're like, well, if you, if you can one pipe like all the way all up to this height, then the time, like, there now. has to be a reward. But there were so many areas like that, like, mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah. Just may eventually have drawn, driven yeah. I think we all just ended up dividing up those bugs when they, they would get, you know, in our bug trackers of, oh, there's a place that doesn't have any loot. So I'm going to go put that in. Hey, it was a big team effort. <laughs> that doesn't involve the Easter eggs that we, we hid in the game, like all the wild wasteland stuff. That was my favorite. Mm -hmm. But I think Old World Blues, that was that was more kind of our Wild Wasteland DLC. Yes, that's very true. And also, um, speaking of visual storytelling, uh, so Daniel just went by that door with the, the sort of red spray painted Old World flag. And what we were hoping for is with visual storytelling, we could start communicating with the different colors of those flags, Matt, because the, the flag symbol is actually uh, associated with road and when you arrive in old world blues he's actually walked through the crater and explored a chunk of it um but what he'll do is he spray paints the red flag symbol for a dangerous area um i believe the white symbol is for it's safe here or um it, you you know you shouldn't be attacked here like or it's safe passage and then he also has a blue flag that indicates oh i've stashed uh you know a resupply cachet here and uh, we sort of we sort of made that part of the visual storytelling for the for the DLC too. I remember there was a great deal of research that I think uh, you and Josh did for I guess the, the the hobo language that is left in like graffiti things and stuff. And like there there was a lot of thought and care that was put into that system. You know, actually, um, I, I if it happened in Fallout, part of it. I do know that when we were doing Wasteland Two that hobo language came out quite a bit, especially for the railroad nomads. Um, but uh, yeah, I, if there was a fallout conversation, so I wasn't as familiar with it. Oh, Jessica's getting some specific level design questions. Uh, Dark Blue Monkey asks, by the way, excellent name, Dark Blue Monkey. Uh, Jessica, is there a game out there which really impressed you for level design and why? Um, trying to think of some, some recent ones. I know they exist. I just played so many games. Um, <laughs> the game that really inspired me to get into level design was Ico, so that's why I brought it up. Um, it's obviously a little boxy now, but still really interesting to go and look at. Um, and I'm trying to, to think of some more recent ones. I was a huge Zelda player younger. I really like um, level design that uses kind of that lock and key system of there are areas that you see that you know you can get to, but you just have to have have unlocked the right mechanics to get there. Um, I thought some of the like smaller, like kind of hidden areas in um, in Skyrim were actually really good. Like there there were some some smaller levels where it was like you had to swim down under this to find a secret place and stuff like that that I really appreciated because um, you didn't see that as much in some of the um, earlier Elder Scrolls games. And um... Oh, uh, Daniel, it looks like uh, the Kickstarter view in the stream, uh, the window has scrolled down, if you can oh, fix no. that when you get a chance. Oh, God. I don't think we're going to get it saved. I think it's going to keep plunging down. Oh, no. <laughs> Our Kickstarter effort is drowning, Jason. What are we going to do? Uh, guess we'll need to keep talking. Uh, oh, we're getting more God. questions. Oh, uh, OK. More more questions for Jessica. 
uh, Jessica, how universal do you find the kits uh, you have to work with? Uh, wow, this is scrolling fast. I'm trying to read this. Uh, do your skills transfer over wholly, or is there a transition period? And if so, how long does that usually take? I think that means like from engine to engine and toolkits to, to toolkit. Um, there, there is a transition period. It can be, usually I would say after a week or two, um, I'm pretty comfortable, but there are always new things you're discovering the longer you work with a, a set of tools. Um, but your basic design skills are really about learning about how things are laid out and where to put enemies and all that kind of stuff. And all of that translates over. So it's, it's as long as you go in and start building levels and start feeling out what feels right and what feels good and what makes sense in terms of where to place loot and where to place enemies, then um, that will all translate over into whatever tools you're using. And that's kind of, I think, the key to being a level designer. Uh, by the way, for those of you on Twitch asking Bethesda specific questions, I'm, I'm intentionally avoiding those so that uh, we, 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 don't, we don't tread into dangerous territory. You know, and uh, to, to sort of piggyback off of uh, one nice thing is if, even if you're if you're learning a new tool set or a new kit, um, one nice aspect of it, which can obviously is a is a huge boon to your game development career, is sometimes there are just certain editors that do one oh, thing shit. fantastically that you wish all the other all the other editors would do. Um, so whenever you have a chance to get involved in tool set discussions or request like functionality you want for an editor, the more range of experiences you have with game editors, that can end up being a, a huge plus. You're like, hey, well, you know what? I really liked, um, you know, the variable, uh, you know, tracking system that the GEC had because it, you know, it helped like avoid a lot of bugs, even though like it required a little bit of upfront effort in the end, it ended up saving a lot of time or you know, a certain like little terrain mapping program you like, like all of those things you can end up like incorporating into future tool sets, but you just have to have exposure to them first and realize, hey, this company did this, did, did this selection of things in their tool set really well. It's worth carrying that over into our future designs. Oh my God, I oh, this is a Sydney Wolfram special. Higgs Village <laughs> is the most prominent moment of visual storytelling, I think, in the whole DLC. Because this is actually where all the think tank brains used to live. And so based on what you know of them already and figure out who, which of them used to live there. And uh, like, and each of them have like little, little tidbits about their, their person, like, well, not little tidbits, like some of them kind of go on over. Dala's house has all the teddy bears in it. And it, oh yeah, and then uh, Zero's house has the, all his, his, his uh, trophy cases of hatred. And, and oh yeah, this is just a lot of, this is a lot of fun to, to do visual storytelling for, I remember passing this off to, um, uh, it was Sydney and, uh, probably Dini. Yes. And, but th there was one environment artist, John Lewis, who, uh, who also oh, yeah, took yeah. part of it. And he's like, okay, yeah, I can do this. And, uh, yeah, all of them just jumped in there and just started, you know, they did a fantastic job. <laughs> God. Wow. I'm kind of impressed in the, in the, Twitch chat, uh, we're getting a mix of questions that are both about Fallout and just general game development for, for the various trades that we're in. We're getting level design questions for Jessica, uh, writing questions for Chris, and uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're covering the whole design gamut. If anybody has system design questions, I can field those too. <laughs> but I, I feel like people want to know more about Fallout right now, because that's, that's what we're playing through, and plus, that <laughs> helps Daniel feel like he's more included. There. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. I'm, ju I'm just reading questions now. I, I, I can't talk and read at the same time. Can anyone right, actually? Oh, okay. That that's a good question for Chris. Um, from Cheese Grater Suicide. When are you going to make your own <laughs> Kickstarter for a game called Chris Avalon does whatever the blank he wants? Uh, you know what? I it's something to consider. I. Uh, I... <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to give that some more thought. I, you know, to be honest, I'm just so busy right now, but in a good way that I, I, so I, I, I think you're actually living. Chris Avalon does whatever uh, the he wants. Well, that's not that's not, that's not true, but that's also good because I think doing whatever I want may not uh, end well. <laughs> Holy shit! This we have a question for good. Daniel. Um, See, uh, Pokemon asks Daniel, time, "Do you enjoy playing?" Uh, you case. can just nod if you do, and we'll we'll get that response he's, in about twenty not, seconds. He's not, he's not enjoying it. No, okay. It's <laughs> you know, this is Doctor Klein's house. Yeah, I want him have a little yeah. bar down. He shook his head yes. Oh. He just nodded. Oh. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, this was yeah. This the Higgs Village was was a lot of fun. We might not. actually, I might actually PB. Surprisingly, uh, Umber Sunna asks. I heard Area Fifty One Two. Um, not to my knowledge. Um, we did have. Uh, I mean, obviously the alien special encounter in Fallout One set the stage for uh, aliens being in Fallout, which we could argue as to whether that's a good thing or not. But uh, there wasn't. I don't recall the Area 51 location from Fallout 2. I know, I know we had the the EPA that was cut, and then um, one other area that I'm spacing on right now. But uh, Area 51, I don't recall being sort of. Uh, if it was there, it certainly didn't last too long in the level. Although the level design in Fallout 2 was chaotic, it was. Uh, we basically just like diced up the wasteland. You know what? The emergency triage to go. Okay, well you get these three areas. You get these two areas now. Go I'll take that. 1740. It's legit a three second PB, but I'll take it because I haven't PB'd in a month. Okay. So I'll take it. I'll take 1740. I'll take that shit. Save splits.